Adobe InDesign is a premier program that is designed specifically for creating longer form documents. You can create these documents for print and digital applications, and it is widely considered to be the industry standard for creating these types of documents. Because InDesign is able to create so many different types of documents, it makes sense that there are going to be a lot of tools and features in this program, many of which you may not need for planners and journals that are considered more lower content um, documents because you're going to have a lot of the same pages repeated over and over. They're not going to be very heavy in text and they're usually not going to be very heavy in graphics either. So because of this, I wanted to create this video for you to narrow down the tools and just discuss with you what I find to be the most important tools for you to use when you're creating planners and journals in InDesign. Okay, so let's get this out of the way really quick. If you are watching this video, I'm going to assume that you already have InDesign since you want to see your tips and tricks. However, if you're following along with my series and you're just getting into it because this is video number three of the series and you don't yet have InDesign, make sure you get it because all of this information is going to be no good to you unless you actually have InDesign. If you don't have it, you can click on my link in the description. Um, as of now, they're doing a seven day free trial. If you want to get just InDesign, it's $22.99 a month. If you want to get the whole creative cloud um, that includes InDesign, it will be uh, $59.99 a month, but you can absolutely just get InDesign if that's what you're looking for, or even just start off with InDesign for now if you want. So, but in order to follow this video, you're gonna need it. Now, the link in my description is an affiliate link, okay? But it's not gonna cost you anything. It's not gonna um, keep you from getting any kind of promotions or anything like that. All it simply does is possibly give me a small commission so that I'm able to keep creating these free videos for you guys. And they are also, it would also be greatly appreciated. I'm not gonna lie, I would really, really appreciate it. But anyway, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and let's jump into the computer and let's start looking at these 30 tips and tricks because there's a lot to go through. Also, I'll mention really quick, there is a link in the description also for a PDF that has all the shortcuts that I think are the most important ones for you to know for this type of application. So while any other shortcuts, uh, PDFs you can find online are gonna have all of the um, top InDesign um, shortcuts on it, this one's gonna be cut down even more just to the ones that I think are the most important ones for you to know. Um, that way, you know, Obviously, if there's too many on there, it's gonna be really hard to find what you need and it won't be really a shortcut, will it? So anyway, let's jump into the computer and let's start to take a look at all these wonderful tips and tricks I have for you. Okay, so now that we're here in InDesign, I'm going to go through my 30 top tips and tricks with you and I have broken them down into sections um, to make it easier to find what you're looking for later if you need to come back to the video. The first section that we're going to be looking at is the um, workspace and document setup tips that I have. So tip number one is that you can create and save your own workspace. So as you start learning InDesign and you start using it, um, you may find that there's certain windows and sections that you use more often and you want to make sure that you have them where it makes the most sense to you. So first I'm going to show you if you come up here um, to the top, you'll see that there's already some preset, InDesign already comes with some preset um, layouts and if I think that it normally starts with Essentials. I like Essentials Classic, but just to give you an idea, here's Essentials. Oh, um, it's a lot more basic. You don't have as much going on on the side. Um, you can always open any windows and add them to the side later if you want, but this one's a little more basic. Whenever you see these arrows, you can click them over. I prefer to use Essential Classics myself, so whenever you're following any videos with me, this is what my setup will look like. I have different sections here. You can always close them um, and add new windows if you want to do that. And it's entirely up to you. If I wanna make this small, um, because I want to see more space here, I can do that and just click that over. Um, so I like to have my properties and my, my CC libraries, um, but I also like to see here. Um, you can also 
make each section smaller and bigger so maybe you don't use your swatches as much or you don't have as you know a lot of different colors maybe you want to see more of the actual document these are the parent pages these are the pages that are actually in your document which I only currently have the one um, then you can click over here and you can see your different layers for the current page that you're on um, and then you can see links so um, if you wanted to move boxes around, I have a text. This comes, I think, automatic in here. You can always close the tab. If I wanted to add something here, you can come up to Windows and you can see all the different windows you can possibly open on the side. Let's see if there is one that, let's say you like to use the effects tab. You click on it, it's gonna give you a little window here. And then all you need to do if you wanna add it to um, your permanent workspace here. Just click and hold and drag it over to wherever you want to add it. Let's see, it will highlight um, in blue and I can go and add it there. I don't know why I made it smaller, but that's okay. So you can see we have here windows and then you click over and effects is here. So you can do that with any of your different windows that you might use on a regular basis and you might wanna add over. You can also save a new workspace. So once you have, if you, if you don't like one of the basic setups and you want to save your own specific layout, you can just go ahead to new workspace here and you can save the workspace however you want, however you have it set up currently. And then going forward, let's go ahead and just save this. Um, we'll say text workspace, we'll say okay. And now when you come over here, you're going to have that option. So if I come here and I wanna go back you're gonna have the option to just go to your test workspace. Tip number two is going to be about how to print with bleeds on all four sides of the page. You can see when you have here a single page, if you see this red square around the page, that is the bleed that we have set up for this particular document that I have. Um, and that is perfectly fine when you only have one page, but typically you're going to be creating spreads. So we see here, it's a spread. So this prints on the back of one page, this is gonna print on the front of the next page, and then when you open up the planner, you're seeing it as a spread. The problem here is that you do not have a bleed on the inside because the pages butt right up against each other. You only have it around this way. And as I discussed in the design video, if you watched that, um, any time that you want to have graphics going off of the page or you want a full background printed on the page, you're going to need bleed on the inside as well. You're going to need a bleed here. Otherwise, when you cut it, there's a chance that you're going to end up um, with extra white or something like that. So there are two options when it comes to doing this, and it really is going to depend on what you want to do. So option number one is if you only need the inside bleed for particular pages. That means the entire document's not gonna have a bleed. So maybe you're only wanting certain sections or certain pages to have that bleed all the way around. This would be your kind of workaround for that. First thing we're gonna do is add one of these pages to our document here. Let's just insert, there we go. Um, okay, and so as I said before, you can see that there is no bleed in the center. The first thing you need to do is to turn off allow pages to shuffle. So you can right click in here. I'm right clicking um, to get this little box and you can come down to where it says allow document pages to shuffle and you want to click it to uncheck it. If you wanna make sure it's unchecked, right click again and you'll see there's no check mark here. So now from this point, after, now that you've said not to allow all the pages to shuffle, we can separate this spread. All you're going to do is click and hold on to the page that you want to move over, the page on the right. And then as you're holding, you're gonna drag over until you see that little line. You see this little line here and then let go. And so now what it's gonna do is it's going to separate the pages and you will see now you have the bleed. Let me zoom in a little bit for you. You have the bleed here on the inside as well. 
and same with this page, but you can see that you're still seeing the left and right page. So see the margin, the wider margins here on the inside, but you need to make sure that you turn the allowed pages to shuffle. Otherwise it's going to shuffle your entire document and then pages that should be on the left with the bleed on the inside might be on the right side and it's gonna be all off. So make sure you do that. And for that reason, I, I always suggest waiting until you've already created your entire document and then go back and do that to the necessary pages and then just adjust your graphics to the um, bleed line. I find that to be the easiest way to do it, but that will be up to you. So let's go ahead and let's just go back now. Okay, option number two is what, what you're going to want to use if you are wanting the bleed for the entire document. So you're gonna have some kind of background image or color um, and you're gonna have it on every page of the document. So in order to do that, we do that through the document setup. So you're gonna wanna know this before you're even creating your document, if that's what you wanna do. Let me just point this out to understand this red line here um, on the inside, this box are the, is the margins. That's what we set up for the document. We have a bigger inside margin here. Um, that's meant for binding or hole punching. And then we have a thinner margin here. That is essentially your safe area. You want to try to keep everything in that area. Let me show you another example. If you see here, everything is in that, that pink box. Um, so those are your margins. And what we're going to do, we can do it off of this page. We're going to create a new document. So file new document. I'm going to go ahead and change this to inches to make it simple. We are going to go with what I typically make my planners is seven by nine. Okay, so that's typically what I want the planner size to be. We have facing, facing pages. Now we're gonna come down here to margins. I will typically use a 0.25 margin for the three outside um, margins. And then if you wanna just change one of these, you have to uncheck here and I like the inside margin to be 0.5 because that is going to give us that inside for binding. So this is typically what a, a setup might look like. What we need to do here is we need to add this bleed to the size of our actual document. That way, when we go to the edge of the document with our background, we have the bleed automatically included and so in order to do that, we're gonna use as an example, we want an, um, an eighth of an inch bleed around the outside, which is a 0.125 inch bleed. So what we're going to do is we need to add a 1.25 inch for each side, which means the width is going to be 0.25 inch because it's 1.25 times two, and then the same for the height. So now we have a quarter of an inch added to both our width and our height of our document. There's one more step and that's to add this to our margins because it goes from the edge of the page in. We want our margins to still represent the, the actual size we want the finished product to be. So we need to add that 1.25 to each of our margins here. So essentially these are going to be 0.375 0.375 and our inside is going to be point, oops, point six, point six two five. And those are going to be our margins. And now we're gonna go ahead and then we're gonna hit create. And so now when we look at our spread, it looks the same, right? But it's actually bigger. You see the margin here, the size it looks here, and then you see there's a bigger margin here. So essentially our bleed is built right into this page. You still want to make sure to keep um, any important information in your margin here. And you also want to keep in mind that any graphics you put in the background are gonna get cut off. There's gonna be an eighth of an inch less on each of those sides because that's, that's what the bleed does. So that brings me into tip number three, which is actually going to help us visualize this document, considering that we had basically some artificial um, bleeds. And you wanna 
usually be able to see where those bleeds actually are. Um, plus you can use this for lots of other reasons. So tip number three is using ruler guides. And your ruler guides are simply, first let's make sure you can see these rulers on the top and the bottom here because you're gonna need to see those in order to, to um, use this tip. If you for some reason don't have those rulers, you're going to simply come up to view and when you come down here, yours will say show rulers. Let me turn them off and I'll show you. When you come down, it will say show rulers instead of hide rulers. And you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna click, um, click that to see your rulers. To create your guide is very easy. Let me first just mention these guides are only for design purposes. They will not export. Okay, so you don't need to worry about that. Having these lines on there is not gonna ruin your document in any way. So to create one, if you wanted to create a vertical guide, you would simply come over to the left ruler, click, hold, and drag over. And now you have this line, and wherever you let go, that's where the line will be. The same for the top for our horizontal guide. Click, hold, and drag. And now that's where your guide will be. There are different types of design things you could want to do and for these to come in handy, but this is the perfect opportunity to show you one way that you can use them to create our bleeds. So if you want to get rid of them, you see I just highlighted, highlighted both of them like you would anything else and you can just hit delete and they are gone. So for our bleeds, we're gonna want an exact amount. As you can see, if you click and drag over, Right, we know each bleed is going to be 1.25. It's going to be kind of hard to find that, but you can do it. Right, there we go, 1.25. You can see it's telling me where it is. We can go ahead and drop it here. But something else you can do now if you want to make sure that your bleed is exactly 1.25 from the inside of this page, what we're going to do, I'm going to show you that you can use the transform tool just like you use for any objects. Okay, so we know that this line we're creating is basically supposed to represent the actual edge of our document page. So what we want to do is we know our page, we want the actual page when it's printed and cut to be seven by nine. So what we're going to do is we're going to highlight our guide here. We're going to come up to object, transform, and we're gonna say move. We're gonna get this box here. Now we want to move it horizontally over seven inches. That should move it exactly 1.25 away from the middle, 0.125 away from the middle. So we're gonna say seven. We're gonna move it horizontally, the position. But instead of just saying okay, which would then just move our guide that we had here over here, we wanna hit copy. And so now when they do, we do that, I know these are very hard to see. Let me zoom in a little bit here. When you do that, let's highlight both of them. It created a copy. You see they're both exactly away from the edge, 1.25. We can do the same thing up here. You can drag it down. Zero is the edge of the page. You can either drag it manually down to 1.25 like that or you could do just like we did with the transform you can start on zero on the edge highlight it object transform move we're going to move this one this time vertically we want to only move it 1.25 and that's okay and now we're going to highlight it object transform move and remember we want our document to be nine inches so we're going to make this nine inches and we're going to say copy this time because we want to leave our original guide. Okay, so now if you see, we have all four guides showing our artificial bleeds and showing us where the edge of our paper is so that you may be able to visualize a little bit better because really all of this is a workaround when it comes to um, adding the bleeds this way. Um, I don't know any other way to do it unless you wanted to have every page in your document separated. Um, you can do that as well, but I think that's so much harder. So one last thing I wanted to say about the guides is that let's say once you have them here, when you start designing, you don't want to accidentally be moving them around, right? So what you can do when you have all your guides set up, no longer need to move them around is you can come up to view 
and we're gonna come down to our grids and guides and then come over to lock guides. And then what that will do is you will no longer be able to move these guides around. Okay, and then if you at any point want to delete them or you need to move them, you can come back up, go to grids and guides and then uncheck lock guides by clicking on it. And actually one last thing I wanted to note is that you can change the color of these guides to see them a little more easily. You're just gonna go to layout, ruler guides, and you can change the color here, just black. Okay, um, just keep in mind that it's not gonna change anything that's currently there, but it will um, change the color for the new guides. If you want to change the color of the guides that are currently there, you have to have them highlighted. So we just have to go over to, um, sorry, to view guides, unlock them so that we can highlight them, highlight them. Now go to layout, ruler guides, change the color to black and then it has changed it. So just keep that in mind. But yeah, if you're having trouble seeing um, the blue and you wanna change it to something else, go ahead. I wouldn't really recommend black because um, you're probably gonna have a lot of, a lot of your documents gonna be in black, most likely, you know, lines and boxes and everything else. You, so you don't want it to get confused. You don't wanna get confused with it. So I would not do it black, but that's how you can change the color to whatever you need. Okay, so the next section of tips that we're gonna be talking about is organization. Tip number four is adding and using bookmarks and using the pages at the bottom of your screen of the screen here. Okay, so bookmarks allow you to create links to jump to certain sections of your document very quickly and easily. So as you are creating many, many pages of your document, it could be annoying and time consuming to have to keep scrolling back and forth to find the pages that you're looking for. If you need to go back and edit something or you wanna check on something or you lose your place, yada, yada, yada. So by creating bookmarks for specific sections, for example, maybe each month of the planner, it's gonna make it much easier and quicker for you to find the sections. This is especially handy when you go to update the planner later. Setting it up at the beginning correctly is gonna make a huge deal and it's always, it's also extremely beneficial when you're creating digital planners because sometimes those are so many more pages. Now, to create your bookmarks is very simple. So you bring up the bookmarks window by going to window, interactive, and then bookmarks. And I think, I, okay, so here it added it right here. You can leave it here on the side so that it's always there. Um, as you're going, you can just click in here. You can drag it out. We already went over that with the document setup side, but here we are. So when you want to create a new one with the page selected where you want to create a section. So let's say we're going to create our new section here and that's gonna be January, all you're gonna do is come down to your bookmarks window here and hit plus. And it's created the bookmark and you can add it, you know, whatever name you wanna add. Okay, now when you wanna create your next one, imagine there's a bunch of pages in between here, but maybe we wanna come here and we wanna say February. So we just hit plus and then we write February. Okay, and so as you're creating your document, you can add in whatever bookmarks you want in order to make it easier. And then later on, when you want to get back to that section, you're just gonna double click and it will jump right to that section. It makes it super easy for you to organize big documents. Now, as far as the page number thing down here, really, I just wanted to make sure to mention that it's down there so you know, um, because again, scrolling can take a while. If you know the page, that you're trying to get to, you can simply, on um, page 11, I wanna get to page one, I can just simply put in page one, hit enter, and it's gonna take me to page one. Okay, tip number five is creating color palettes for easy access to colors. Because creating color swatches for your document is the quickest and easiest way to add colors throughout creation and to keep things consistent, right? So uh, as you're designing your planner, as you're going through, and you're like, I really like that color, that's cute. Let's go ahead and save a swatch. That way, when you wanna use it anywhere throughout, you have that swatch readily available. When you create these swatches, they will only be in the current document, so keep that in mind. So any, if in this document, any swatch 
swatches I create. If I create a new document, nothing will be in there. So to create new swatches, double click on the color square, square on the left toolbox here. Okay, then you can go ahead and you can find your color. You can use the color picker here to find whatever color you want. Um, or you, if you know the hex code, you can add that in here. Or if you have a picture that you want to take a color from, um, you can use the dropper tool and then you can pick up any color. So you had a photo here and you wanted to pick a color out of it in order to use that, you can do that. Okay, let's just go back in here and let's pick another color. Um, doesn't really matter which color and we like this color. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna say add CMYK swatch. And then it has now added it down here in the swatches window. If you don't have the window showing and you want it over there on the side, you can go ahead and hit window and then come down to color and then swatches. It's grayed out right now because I have this box open. Um, so let's just hit okay. So what we can do now from here, the swatch is in here. Um, it automatically is going to name it with the color. Um, I like to rename this. So you can just double click on it and come up. And to rename it, you have to uncheck name with color value. That's just the default. So if you uncheck that, it's gonna give you this box. So we're gonna say, you know, pink. We're just gonna call it pink and then we're gonna hit okay. So that makes it a little cleaner here. You can also see it up here. Okay, so the other thing that, the other reason I like to actually change the name is because sometimes, let's say I really like this pink color, this is gonna be throughout my planner, but maybe sometimes I wanna have it as a background, more of like a highlight. So I need there to be a lighter version of it. So let me go ahead and create a box here so I can show you. I'm gonna create two boxes so I can show you an example. Okay, so this is our original color. Well, let's say that I want to um, have a lighter version of this because it's going to be in the background. I can go up here and I can just change the tint to make it a lighter tint of that same color. And then what you can do from there is you can just create a new swatch and it's going to automatically create the new swatch with the same color name but with the tint percentage. And so again, you can keep things a little cleaner for when you're de designing. So maybe you're using this for the actual font itself in some areas, and then maybe for this one, you're using as a highlight in the background. You can also rename this if you wanted to, but you don't really have to. You can just say, okay, but well this is a tint of the pink. One last thing I wanted to mention about color swatches is that you can also create folders. You see I have one here for different color swatches. So let's say you have certain sections of your planner or journal um, that you want certain colors in. Say you want a different color palette for each month or each season. You can go ahead and create your um, swatches and you can group them into folders. You would just go down here to, and now if I have this color highlighted, that's going to go into the folder, so just keep that in mind. Go down here and click on new folder. You'll see that here. You can double click to change the name. Let's say January, this is gonna be our January colors, okay? And now pink is in that folder. You can toggle it on, toggle it off, because if you have a lot of folders, it might get a little crazy. And if you want to add swatches you already have to that folder, like let's say you're deciding afterwards, you wanted to separate it, just click, hold, and drag, and you can drag it down here, and now you can add your swatch to that folder. Okay, so now let's move into our next section, which is viewing. So for tip number six, in order to see presentation mode, in other words, in order to see what it will actually look like when it's exported or printed out with all, all your extra lines and boxes, let's go over to here. You can see all of these um, text boxes and such, and you can see your margins. All you need to do with the selection tool selected, you don't wanna be in a text box or anything, is hit W. And that is going to show you what it will look like when you actually export it without all of your design elements, um, you know, all the boxes and everything else. And then if you wanna go back, just go ahead and hit W again. I use this constantly because with all of those extra lines, sometimes it's a little hard to tell um, what exactly it's gonna look like. So that's it, W on, off, very easy. Tip number seven. 
changing your UI size. Um, if you are having trouble seeing and you want to see it a little bit easier, maybe you have a smaller screen, or let's say you want more screen, you want more real estate to work with, you can change your UI sizing. Okay, so what we're going to do, this is going to be a little bit different, I believe, for um, Windows users. I believe you're going to go to Edit up here and then you should have preferences in there and then you're going to go to ui scaling but for mac users we're going to go to indesign up here and then preferences and then you'll see user interface scaling okay and now from here you can go ahead and you can make it bigger or smaller um it's showing you a little example here a little bit bigger a little bit bigger if you want to see it better, a little bit smaller if you want more real estate. Let's see what happens. But you actually have to restart InDesign in order to be able to see the changes. So let's just go in here. Let's make it, let's make it big. Let's make those big and that way we can show you um, what it's gonna look like when we go back in there. And now look how much bigger the screen is. It's a lot bigger. You can see it, everything is a lot bigger. But see how small the workspace here is because everything else is so much bigger. So if you have like, if you're, I'm, you know, I'm working on a laptop, so um, I only have so much screen. But I mean, if you're working on a bigger screen, you may be able to get away with this. Um, bigger thing here, you can see this clearer, but you're gonna have to make this smaller in order to see it. So that's changing the UI. Let me go back and change this again. Tip number eight is how you can look at your document and see it the actual size of the page that would be printed out. So when you're looking at this, you're seeing two full pages and it's a it's pretty small view. And sometimes it's kind of hard to tell are those numbers gonna be big enough? Are those letters going to be big enough when they're printed out? Can you actually see them? The best way to see this is to hit Control-1 or for a Mac, Command-1, and it's going to give you the actual size view and you can get a better look at if things are big enough, what they're gonna look like when they're actually printed. Um, that's the shortcut for it, but you can always come up to View and come down to actual size and you just click that and it will I'll show you the actual size. So now we're going to move on to the next section which is parent pages. That's these over here. That's where you're going to be doing most of your work in is the parent pages. So what is important to show you is how you can override, apply, rename those um, parent pages. So really quickly, I don't want to show you everything, but really quickly if we're in here, if you want to create a new parent page, you're just going to come down here and you have to be clicked in the parent page section. You don't want to be clicked in the document section here and you're going to hit plus and it's going to create a new parent page. If you want to rename this, which I always recommend, you can just right click, come down to parent page options. Here, from here, you can rename this whatever prefix you want. This is just for your organization reasons. You can name it whatever you want there. And now, um, and number of pages is two, that's a spread. If you want it to be just one page, you can change this to a one. Uh, but this is one thing I definitely want to show you as part of this trip, uh, tip is based on parent, okay? Because you can base this on one of these other parents and then add to it from there. Where this could come in really handy is if you're creating a particular background, you might want to create one spread for a background page. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna add a photo to the background of this page. I want this to be my background. Maybe I'm gonna take the opacity down a little bit. We're gonna bring the opacity down because I want to create that as a background. Let's go ahead and copy it over here. Okay, so now we have, let's say, we're gonna name this our parent background page, parent options. We're gonna say background, I can type background, okay? 
Now if I come here and I'm gonna do a new parent page, parent page options, I want to base this one off of the background. Okay, and that way, anytime I want these guys in the background, I can just reference the pages with these guys in the background without having to copy and paste them over and over again. And what also, the other way that this is beneficial is, let's say I'm doing, we're gonna use the dogs as an example. I, make, I wanna make different planners down the road of different dogs. So right now I might have a Husky picture here and then later down the road, I'm gonna to wanna to change it to a golden doodle. And in that case, all I need to do instead of, if I have a bunch of parent pages with this background, instead of having to go through and change all of those parent pages, I'm only having to change this one and it's gonna go ahead and change those. Let's add a different, let's add a different photo here. That one is the same one, okay. So I wanna use this photo instead. And so what you'll see here is if I come over here, it has now changed the photo here. And so that is a big benefit of the parent pages and referencing, creating a background page and referencing it later. Um, this is something you definitely would have seen in my digital, um, Planner video. So now we've added a parent page, we've renamed a parent page, we've um, referenced another parent page. The last thing I wanted to show you about parent pages in this video is that you can override parent page items. So for example, you have your parent page. These all, when you apply, are gonna have the same dates. You need to change the dates after you add the pages. You have the option to click here, right click, on your pages and say override all parent page items. That is definitely something you do not want to do because now the parent page is almost useless and the fact that if you go later and update this parent page, anything that was overridden in your document is not going to update. So, you know, you're kind of defeating the purpose of the parent page. Okay, so in, instead of overriding the entire page, what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna override only certain things. So you're gonna need to change the dates, you're gonna wanna override those, you're gonna need to change your calendar, you're gonna wanna override that, and anything you don't need to override, you're gonna wanna leave. So in order to do that, when you're in your document and you're going to update or edit, you know, add the dates, you're going to hit Command or Control and shift and then click on whatever it is that you want to override. Okay, now you can go ahead when you're, again, we're in our document here. Um, you can go ahead and you can edit just like you need to. Change the date there. Okay, again, command and shift or control and shift and then click on whatever it is that you want to update. That is going to be your absolute best bet. Just keep in mind that if you go to um, an update this parent page, anything you've overridden is not going to update. That's why it's also important that we use styles and I will get into that later on in the tips, um, but that's overwriting our parent pages. And one more thing in this section I wanted to mention is, is tip 10 and that is to add a background to a page without overwriting your entire document. So I showed you how to add a background over here in the parent pages. Um, because you might wanna use that same background on multiple pages. But if you're wanting to add a background just to a specific page in the document, you don't wanna to have to create, create a different parent page if let's say every week you're gonna have a different um, thing in the background. So in order to add, now if you see we're here, we can't edit anything, right? Um, if I try to add it to the parent page, it's gonna add the same to everything. If I try to add something here, it's going to be on top. Okay, it's going to be on top of everything and it's gonna be blocking it, which is not what we want, right? And to avoid overwriting all of this, just to put it behind it, there's one easy solution. So to add a background without overriding all of your items on that, we're gonna go over with the page selected that you're working on. We're going to go over to layers. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to hit plus here to create a new layer. And now on this layer, 
we're going to go ahead and we are going to add our we're going to add our item right maybe you want to bring down the opacity a little bit so it's not so broad but whatever the case you're going to come back here and you're going to drag this layer below our main layer Let's bring the opacity back up so you can see what I mean, okay? So you can see the lines over here are behind it and this item is in the background. Once you add a background, if you want to lock it so you're not messing with it, um, you can go ahead and just lock it. But that's how you're gonna add something to the background of a, a page that is um, has a parent page applied to it without overwriting the items. Okay, the next section that we're talking about is text. Okay, so tip number 11 is looking out for text being too big for a box. It might be something that you could easily overlook and not notice, so I wanted to make sure to mention this tip. So let's say I'm creating this box here. I'm gonna type um, text box too small. Okay, so if I make this text, if it's too big, let's go ahead and make this a bit bigger. What you're gonna see is a, whole, a lot of the text disappeared. And how you're gonna know this is you are going to have this little, that doesn't seem to even wanna get bigger. There is a little plus here, a little square with a little plus that's gonna indicate that you have text hiding. So if you do want the, the text to remain that, either you can make it smaller or if you want the text to remain that size, you're gonna have to make the actual text box bigger in order to show all of your text. Again, see now that little red plus has disappeared. So you just wanna keep an eye out for that because if you have um, a header or something and you change the text or you change the size of the text, you may not notice that text is missing. If you see this little box, that's a really good indication or that will let you know that there is um, text that is in that box and is not being shown. Tip number 12 is adjusting the letting, kerning, and tracking of text. So I really just wanted to take a moment to explain the difference and how you can um, change these things around. So the difference between kerning and tracking is that kerning is between just two letters where tracking is between all of the letters. So if you wanted to say just adjust, um, you don't like how close these two O's are, you would just put your um, cursor between the two letters that you want to increase the letting for, and then you can come over here to this VA that has just the arrow under one letter, and you can adjust that up or down, and it's going to adjust just those two letters. Now, tracking, on the other hand, over here, is going to adjust the whole entire sentence you have there. For this one, you wanna have the whole, whatever you want to track, you want it highlighted. So let's go ahead and let's just do this one word and we're gonna click over here and then you wanna add it. It's going to add equal space between all the letters within that word or whatever you have highlighted. So you can really create some customized looks in this way. That's kerning and tracking and then letting is the space between. Um, so let's make this two lines here. Um, okay, I don't like how um, big of a gap there is between these two. So I'm gonna come over here to the two A's on top of each other with a little arrow, and I'm gonna click in here, and I'm just going to you know, go down to make them closer. And maybe I like that a little bit better. And that is, um, that is letting. So letting is basically your line spacing. Um, kerning is between two, just two letters and then tracking is gonna be between all letters evenly. Well, all letters for the words that you have highlighted evenly. Tip number 13 is that you can type on a path. So I'm gonna go ahead here and I'm gonna go create a shape so I can show you. We'll create a circle. Um, let's go ahead, you can also create a line. Um, let's draw. We're just gonna draw a squiggly line like that. Let's take out the fill, okay? 
Um, you can use any of the drawing tools to draw any kind of shape. I know that one's a little bit wonky. So once you've created the shape that you want to um, have your text on, you would just simply come up to the text box here. But instead of just clicking on it, click and hold, and it's going to give you the other text option called Type on a Path. Okay, go there and click on that. So really all you need to do is click on the path that you want to type on. And then once you've clicked on it, let's zoom in a little bit here, you can just simply start typing. And you will type on that path. Same thing here. I want to type on this path. And it's going to type on that path. And that's how you can type on a path. And if obviously um, you're probably not going to want to see the shape you I mean maybe you do but you don't necessarily you can just turn off the stroke and the fill and now you just have it typed on the path let's hit W and see what it looks like if you want to adjust the start and end point you're just gonna grab and hold one of these little legs here and you can change your end point um, if you want to flip it inside, you would just come over here and you're going to double click here on the type on a path tool with it highlighted and you can go ahead and you can say path to center, but you can say flip and it will put it on the inside versus the outside of the path. Okay, tip number 14 is searching for new fonts in Adobe Fonts. So you can see over here in fonts, there's a lot selected. Or there's a lot to offer here. I actually have selected only the, um, the cloud, which is things I got from fonts I got from Adobe Fonts. But if you uncheck that, um, you have different filters up here to filter through, but there are already a lot of fonts that come already preloaded in Adobe. Um, however, there are a lot more fonts out there that you can choose from. All you're going to do is come over and go to Adobe. You can just look up Adobe fonts. Let's go here. So as long as you're signed in, um, with the same account that you have your um, are signed into with InDesign, then it should save right to your CC's library. So if you're not signed in, make sure you sign in. But from here, you can browse all. There's tons of ways to filter through to try to find different fonts that you may be interested in. You can also find font packs which are going to have different fonts together. Um, but what I wanted to show you, because you can sit there and you can go through, but there's two things I wanted to show you in the Adobe fonts. The first one is how you can add the fonts, download fonts to your Creative Cloud and have them in your InDesign or any of your Adobe products. Um, let's look at this one because this one has three fonts within the family. So this family of fonts has three different versions of the fonts. If you only want one particular one, you can just hit add font. If you want all three, you can go ahead and hit add family. And once you do that, you will then automatically have them uploaded into your um, InDesign. It will show up over here. If you want to see just what you've downloaded, that's what this little cloud means. You can go ahead and click that and it will just show you the active fonts that you've downloaded, but it will all automatically do it as long as you're signed in. The one other thing I wanted to show you in here that I think is um, really cool because all of these fonts are included with your Adobe um, Creative Cloud. So you don't have to pay for any of these fonts. They're all included and there are a lot of them. But um, if you have another font you found somewhere that you think is cute, say you took a picture of it, say you found it on the internet and you maybe wanted to do a screenshot of it, um, let's go out to the internet here. Let's just do, um, let's do a screenshot of just Google, just this text. That's what it's going to be looking at, right? So let's go ahead and let's do that. Let's capture. Let's go back over here. And what you can do in this search is you can add a picture. 
Okay, so let's find that on our desktop here. And when you add a picture, it's going to scan the font and it's going to give you options. You can go ahead and adjust this to include the whole word or whatever you're wanting it to look at. And it's gonna give you suggestions for similar fonts that are included in Adobe Fonts, which is really nice. So you don't have to go out there and pay for fonts. It's going to show you of course, it's doing something a little weird, but it's going to show you um, similar. It's looking at the G, the L, the E, and it's going to show you similar fonts. Then you can go over here to the to the font that's included in Adobe Fonts, and then you can download it from there. So that's a really cool feature if you don't know. Um, and again, you could do this with pictures of fonts that you just took, like you're out shopping somewhere and you're like, oh, that font's really cute. I could use that somewhere and um, take a picture of it and you can just add the photo in here and it will um, go ahead and scan it and give you the closest font that it thinks that it has. It's not always, you know, perfect, but it works quite well and it makes things a lot easier. Tip number 15 is how to center text in a box vertically. So you'll see here, I actually have changed my default setting to um, to have text in boxes vertical, uh, centered vertically, but your InDesign doesn't come automatically like that. So let me show you what it's typically gonna look like. Okay, so typically when you create a new text box, in InDesign, it's going to be in the top of the box. And you know that if you wanted to center it horizontally, you can just come over here and hit center and or to the right, you know, just like anything else. However, when you're in other programs like say Word or something like that, Google Sheets or Google Docs, um, there is an option to center it vertically or on the bottom of the box. It's not as clear of an option here. So in order to center it or put it on the bottom side of the box, you're going to hit command or control B and it's going to give you this text frames options. And there's quite a few things that you can change in here, but what I'm talking about is the vertical justification. So you can now center it. You can now put it at the bottom and you can justify it, which is, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but that is an option. So I usually like to have it centered, but that's how you can do it. Control B or Command B on a, a Mac. And that's how you would change that. Okay, the next section that we're gonna talk about is styles. And this is this is a big one. Um, so a character style, I'm gonna first talk about the difference between the styles. So there's a character style, which is a collection of character formatting attributes that you can that can be applied to text in a single step, right? A paragraph style, however, includes those character style attributes and includes the paragraph formatting attributes as well. And basically for character styles, you can highlight a particular letter, you can highlight a particular word, and you can apply styles to just that. Um, if you are using a paragraph style, it will be applying to your entire paragraph. You're not gonna be able to just apply it to a letter or a word. So just keep that in mind, but paragraph styles are great because it takes into account more things, right? It's gonna have more attributes that it saves for that style. So tip number 16 is paragraph styles. Again, you use these if you wanna capture as much information as possible. It will apply to the entire paragraph. Um, I have them in this little bar here, but you can come over to type and you can come over to character styles, paragraph styles. Okay. And it will, it just expanded mine, but it may be a separate box for yours because I already have them open. So they have some built-in style packs, which are pretty cool. If you want to just start with one of those, which has multiple different, um, fonts that go together and it can add it automatically. That's if you see one that you really like that you think is cute, then that's a good way to start. But, Let's go over to paragraph styles here. I have a bunch of them. So let's say you have a bunch of text. Fill placeholder text. Okay. So you have this whole paragraph with text. Let's show an example here. Um, you can see in the properties panel all the different things. Uh, you have the font. You have the size of the font. You have um, 
the fill and things like that, right? So let's say I like this font, I like this size, I like everything about it. I wanna go ahead and I wanna make this a paragraph style with um, that highlighted. You're just gonna go over here to the paragraph styles window and you're gonna hit the plus to create a new style. And now from this point, you can double click on it. You can change the name. So um, tips and tricks paragraph we'll just say para okay and you can see here all the style settings that they're saving as part of this paragraph style so now if I wanted to now create another text box here let's fill it with some okay these are the same here or what you want to do is you want to also go ahead you should be able to just be clicked in it and you want to make this our tips and tricks and now it should be see highlighted here that means that it's part of that paragraph style so let's say I'm like okay you know what I'm working on this section just imagine you have some multiple pages 200 pages of the same text um, let's say I you know I really don't like this font I want to go change this font um, that size looks good Let, let's just, it's a little small that font some fonts are smaller than others let's go ahead and let's make that a little bit bigger okay oh I like that a lot better right well this didn't change even though they're both connected to the same paragraph styles because what you need to do is you need to redefine this style so if this is how you want the rest of it to be you can go ahead right click over here and click redefine style and now oh, I must not have added that to the um, paragraph style but now it changed the other anything else that was connected to that tips and tricks paragraph style so as you can imagine when you have a long document this can make things a lot easier and also you notice that all I really had to do was be clicked into the paragraph to some paragraph somewhere and it will change it. Now this is going to be different than say character styles. Let's go ahead and let's create another box. Let's fill it with text. Now I want to create a character style. Keep in mind this can be just a word so we have to actually highlight what it is we want to change. Let's go ahead and let's create a style by hitting the plus. Let's name it um, tips character. That's fine. Um, you can see here there's far less that it's saving because the character styles are not taking into account any of the paragraph settings. So now that I have that attached, let's go create, you know what? you can have character styles on top of paragraph styles at also. So this whole paragraph is set up as one thing. Maybe I want to change this one, um, make that the tips character and see it has adjusted it. And now let's say I want to change this. It's the same process. I'm going to change the font. Let's go ahead and let's change the text color and let's make it bigger or smaller that's smaller let's make it bigger so you can see what we're looking at actually there you go um of course you can see because i didn't have this e highlighted it didn't actually adjust it so what we're going to do is that's fine all we're going to do is come over to here and we're going to redefine style and because that E was connected to it, it redefined the style as it is. So that's it. I mean, that's the difference, big difference in character and paragraph styles. But like I said before, this can make things a lot easier as you're going and you're designing your planner. If you add these styles as you go, it's going to make things a lot easier down the road, right? So like maybe all of your page headers, you want to have the same font about the same size and the same color then you would go ahead and you can create, I think I have this under a paragraph, page headers, right? So all of my pages are gonna have the same, 
where are all my page headers, <laughs> this same attributes so that if I want to go and I want to change the font for all my headers, I don't have to go page by page by page, every parent page and change. Um, or even worse, you know, when it comes to the dates I was telling you about changing. So let's look at this for an example. If you've changed this date here, which you're going to have to do on a dated planner, you're going to have to override these from the parent page, which means you can't just update them from the parent page. But if you have them all connected to a style, say weekday header style, then if you go and you change it and you redefine the style, it's going to change it on all of your pages. So hundreds of pages, it's going to save you a lot of time. So the easiest thing to do is set them up as you're going. So even if you don't know 100% that you want to keep that particular font um, or color or style in general, still go ahead and create a style out of it, name it for something you know, and that way later on when you want to decide what font you're using or you want to change the font, you can do that. Okay, I know that was a long tip. I apologize. And then tip number 18. So 16 was paragraph style, 17 was character style, 18 is table style. So you can do the same similar thing. It will be um, applied only to the table setups, okay, for the table styles. The text in the table, you have character styles and paragraph styles applied to. So the table styles will only be for the actual table setup. So let's say every time you take, you create a table, you want it to be every, highlighted every third column and you want it to be this color or that color and this font and so on and so forth. Um, you can set up a style for that. So every time you go to create a table, you apply that style and it automatically makes it exactly the way they all are. One quick note, which I don't have as a separate tip, but I do want to mention is that if you are going to redefine a style and it seems like it's not doing what you expect it to do, what you want to do is you want to right click on here. And if there was multiple styles, let me see if it's going to show me here. Okay. When I right click on here, it's going to show me that I have multiple styles applied because I had a character style and a paragraph style applied, which is fine. But sometimes when you go to change things, um, it may not act the way you expect it to. If that's the case, you can apply and clear the style that's getting in the way. So if I say apply tips and tricks here, which is what the paragraphs are, it's not going to change it. See, I hit to apply it. It hasn't changed it because the char character style is there. But if I right click and I hit clear character styles, it's going to match the paragraph style. So if, if anything is looking a little funky, it's not doing what you want. That may be the case. Just look under here and see if it's telling you there's something else applied to it. Okay, so tip number 19 is going to be about images because sometimes they can, if you're not used to working with images in InDesign, it can be a little bit funky. So let's go ahead and let's apply an image and close this. So let's go ahead and let's place an image here. Any image. All right, we're going to apply this now. If you just try to resize this like normal, it's just going to resize the box. Okay. It's not going to resize the actual image. If you try to make it smaller, it's going to cut off the image, right? So what you need to do in order to actually resize an image in InDesign, which this is different than the other Adobe products. Okay. And that's why I wanted to make sure to mention it. You're going to hit command and shift or control and shift and hold that while you're resizing. And then that way, when you resize, it will resize the whole image. So when you just resize this box, it's just resizing the frame, which could work out okay if you're trying to crop your image. Also about images, if you wanted to move it around in the box. So for example, sometimes you may want to put this image in a frame. Let's go ahead and let's create, get rid of the fill. So what you would do here is you would say copy and then what you're going to do is edit and paste into, and this is a tip I'm going to go over later. And so now you have this image in an actual frame, but it doesn't really fit in the frame that well, and maybe it's not really centered. Um, so if you hold on to this circle, click and hold the circle, you are moving the item 
around within the actual frame, which you're doing the same here. It's just an invisible frame. But I just wanted to show you why you why that would be something you might want. Um, and then you can double click on it and you can hold your command shift to make it smaller and fit it in your frame more, but I'll go over frames afterwards, but I just wanted to show you that's what this circle is. So if you're going to, let's say you want to move this image over here and all of a sudden you're moving it and the image has disappeared, that's probably because you grabbed this circle in the middle. So it can be a little bit clunky um, when you're trying to, to work with it. Also, one more thing I want to mention about images is maybe it doesn't look clear. This one looks pretty clear, but sometimes when, depending on how your document is set up, InDesign will, will add images at a lower quality so that your computer continues and the program continues to run as fast as possible. This doesn't mean that that's the way it's going to export. Okay. It's just a way to keep it faster. So if you want to see the actual clarity of your image and what it'll look like when you export, you just want to right click on your image and come down to, um, I don't know if you can see that. I think it's cutting off on the bottom. Um, let me do this. Let me zoom out a little bit. Okay, if you can't see that, it might be cut off here on the bottom of the screen. Um, it says display performance. So you're going to right click and come down to display performance. Or you, with this highlighted, you can come to view and display performance. And you want to see it on high quality. So I'm going to show you what I mean. It'll, a lot of times come through as typical display or fast display. So typical display. Let's zoom in. See, it looks a little bit, it looks quite blurry and pixelated. Um, the same thing, fast display is, oh, fast display, that's right. Fast display just doesn't even show the image at all. Um, so like if you already have the image set and you know it's good and whatever and you want to change it to fast display, this is going to keep your system running as fast as possible um, without creating a bunch of lag. So, but typical is usually what it's going to look like when you bring it in. You're going to be like, oh, what's wrong with my image? So if you just want to double check and make sure it's nice and clear, high quality, there we go. That's what you want to do to make sure it's not actually blurry and then it's going to look good when you print it out. So now we're going to move on to the editing and creating section and we are going to jump into tip number 20 which is adding and editing hyperlinks. For those of you creating digital planners, hyperlinks are going to be a very important part of those planners. And InDesign does not come set up with shortcuts for adding and editing hyperlinks. Why? I don't know. But you can add those in. I'm going to show you how to actually add shortcuts in tip number 29. So if you want to be able to do that, make sure you watch tip number 29. But in this tip, I just wanted to talk about hyperlinks in general, um, because you need to be careful because if you attempt to add a hyperlink to something, um, that is grouped with something else. It will look like it works in InDesign. It does work in InDesign, but when you export it and bring it into GoodNotes, it's not going to work and your customer is going to say, hey, these hyperlinks are not working properly. Um, and that's why. So to avoid that, also the fact that that are parent page sections that you don't necessarily want to override just to add a hyperlink. So um, for these two reasons, my suggestion is always to add a box. Let's go ahead here, okay? So I would not be able to just add a hyperlink here because you have to have something to add it to, and this is locked, right? And you wouldn't want to add it to anything that's grouped together. So what you do is you create a placeholder box. That's what these are here. You can do a rectangle. You can do, you know, all the same shapes, but these boxes don't actually show up. They're just placeholders. You can use them for putting images in or you can use them for adding a hyperlink. So you can do it over whatever section you want. It doesn't even matter. It could be over the whole box. It could be over just a letter, a single letter. I'm creating new boxes. <laughs> it could be over just a single letter like this. But when you, let's hit W and C presentation mode, you're not going to see those boxes. But this is going to allow you to add a hyperlink to it. So you can right click and then come down to 
hyperlinks and then say a new hyperlink and then you can add your hyperlink here it could be URL but if you're doing it within a planner you're going to want it to go to a certain page right and then you're going to want to tell it what page it is you want it to go to so let's say we want it to go to page one for that hyperlink you can play with the appearance here that's totally up to you I just leave it okay and now you're going to get this dotted box around it and that indicates there's a hyperlink there if you want to edit this hyperlink you can right click hyperlinks and you can say either go to destination or you can edit which will bring that box back up again if you want to test it out and make sure you're in the right destination you can say go to destination it brings us to page one so now i have to find my hyperlinks again <laughs> So that's working with hyperlinks. And my big tip for working with hyperlinks is to use these placeholder boxes to add the hyperlinks to. You can put them wherever you want and you will not see them um, on the export. Tip number 21 is locking layers. Okay, so when you are designing a page, you will a lot of times end up with multiple layers on top of other things. And maybe you're trying to get a hold of something and something's behind something else. Um, sometimes it's easier when you know something's in the right spot and you want to lock it. Let me go to here, okay? I don't want to be tempted to accidentally click any of this. So you can always go over to the layers panel here if you're in essentials. Um, I am in essentials classic. There you go. Um, you can go over to layers here and you can either click here and it will show you which item, like if you didn't name all of these, uh, and you can just simply click that and it will lock it so that, that's the wrong one, which one did I just lock? This one. <laughs> it will lock it so that you can't move it. So you can't accidentally drag it around. So let's say all of these you can, this is already in a group, you can lock it, and now that group cannot be moved around. Um, and you don't have to worry about messing anything up. And then if you need to change it, you can go ahead and um, unlock it, and it will be unlocked. Tip number 22 is paste in place. And this is something I use a lot because for planners, especially if you're gonna have something like these mini planners, let's say I need to change this out. I've done February's or January's and now I'm on February. I mean, you could create a separate parent page for each, but you don't really need to um, if you want, if I want to change this, but there's four weeks, right? I don't want to have to redo that every time. I also don't want to have to copy and paste and line it up. And that's where paste in place comes in so handy. And I do use it a lot. So let's get rid of that we need February to be here so what we're going to do is we are going to highlight we are going to hit command C or control C to copy and now we're going to come click on here anywhere on this page and to paste in place we're going to hit shift control alt and V or if you're on a Mac it's shift command opt and V so option and V so command option shift and then hit V and now it's going to paste it in place exactly where it was on uh, the page where you copied it right so see how quick that is it's in the exact right place so when you have a lot of pages of the same things this comes in very very handy um, I don't know how much this would be used in other types of applications, um, but for creating planners and journals where you have a lot of repeating pages, it is absolutely a wonderful thing to know. Tip number 23 is paste into, which I showed you before when I was showing you how to, um, to put this photo into a frame. The shortcut is control alt V or command option V, no matter what shape or something you want it to be. When I've, I've used this, let me just delete all this. So when I've used this is let's say, let's say you create a table and you want rounded corners, for example. So what I had done here was I created a table. That's essentially what this is in here is a table. But I wanted the corners to be rounded and that's not a way 
there's no way to do that in InDesign for um, tables. So what you can do is you create your rectangle and then you copy and paste your table into the rectangle frame. That's just an example of when you would use it. And that's what we did here. So let's try that again. Let's create a circle. Let's go ahead and create a circle. We don't want to fill. Let's get rid of the fill. But we want this nice little frame around the outside. Let's just make the frame purple. Right? So now we want to take this. So what we're going to do is Control or Command C to copy it. And then we're going to select our frame that we want it to go into. And then we are going to click Command Option V or Control Alt V. And we're going to paste it into. Um, and now it's in the frame. And from there, you can adjust it where you need to adjust it if you want to make it smaller, if you want to move it around. But that's how you paste it into a frame. OK, so tip number 24 is to copy and paste by clicking and dragging while holding, alt, while holding Alt or Option. And this makes things a lot easier when, say, you're going to create um, like weekly. Maybe you wanted to copy these over here. So let's go ahead. You can always hit Control-C to copy. We'll say Control-V. We'll put this over here. So you can do that or, you know, Control-Copy, come over here or hit control V, then move it over, or you just highlight what you want to copy. You hold option or alt, click and drag over. And for a bonus, if you want to keep it straight across, you just hold shift and it will now keep it exactly level. And there we go. Just like that, you have a copy, which also brings me into step, uh, tip number 25, which is step and repeat. Now, if you've used Illustrator, um, you might know um, Control D, which will allow you to redo the last thing you did. InDesign doesn't have that option. So um, let's say you had wanted to copy this. You'd wanted to copy this over. And then you said, OK, I want to copy it again. And I want to copy it again. OK, but now you don't know if these are even. And it takes a little while if you have a lot of things that you're doing like that. So what you can do is whenever you do something, I'm going to copy and paste this. And now I'm going to go up to edit. This is still highlighted, OK? So edit and step and repeat. And I'm going to tell InDesign how many times you want to repeat that last thing that you just did. It doesn't have to just be copying. Maybe you just move something over, but usually it's going to be used for copying. You're just telling InDesign you want to repeat the last thing you did and you tell it how many times do you want to repeat it. So let's say we want four more copies like that. And when you click OK, it's going to all be evenly spaced because it's going to base the distance that you created here. So how far you moved it over from there. And now you have all of those copies nice and easy and perfectly um, lined up and straight. Tip number 26 is that you can enter any form of measurement and it will automatically convert it. You can also do math. So um, for example, let's say let's create this. OK, we have our size here. We have our width and we have our height. But well, let's say we need to make this a certain amount of millimeters somebody asked for. Maybe we need 20 millimeters. You don't have to go and convert that, OK? You have your document set up as in inches. But all you need to do is come over here and type in 20 mm and hit tab. And it's going to um, automatically convert it for you to inches. So you don't need to do that. It's the same here as if you wanted to do math. Let's say you're like, it's 4.46 inches, but I want to I want it to be 1.25 inches smaller. You can just do minus 1.25 and it's going to automatically do that for you. So and this comes in handy. And the reason I like to mention this is because a lot of times when I'm creating the lines 
and we will sh I will sh definitely show you this throughout the videos, but I usually do this with um, tables. And so uh, you want it to be like a standard size, which is usually like seven millimeters or five millimeters. And that's usually what people go by. Um, instead of having to convert that to inches, you can just go ahead and type seven millimeters is what you want the height to be and it will convert it for you. Tip number 27, we're almost done. <laughs> to select something that is hiding behind something else. As I said earlier, you can always lock the top item, um, lock the layer or the object in the layer um, in order to be able to get to something behind something else. So I have this box behind, or this circle behind this other circle and I need to access it. But when I, um, I need to select it, but when I try to select it, it's only selecting the top box, right? So one thing you can do is you can come over to layers. You can see I have the top selected. It's showing it in blue. You can lock that and then you can now grab the one behind it. But if you don't want to do all that, like let's say you have a lot of stuff in here and you don't want to have to go through your layers, a quicker way to do it is you select the top and then hold control or command and select it again and it's going to select the one behind it. So that's the quicker, easier way to do it. Either way will work just fine. So the next section that we are talking about, the last section is shortcuts. Tip number 28, finding and creating shortcuts. So shortcuts are listed next to the action or tool if you're unsure what they are. So when you go to look to do anything, um, whether you right click here, copy, paste, cut, you know, so on and so forth, it's showing you here what the shortcut is for it. So you can see that in there, you can see that in any of these, you can see whatever has a shortcut. Um, but that's how you can go and you can find shortcuts for a specific thing. Um, there is another place you can go, but it's a little harder to find, but this is what we're gonna need to do in order to create a new shortcut. So what you're gonna do is go over to edit we're going to go down to keyboard shortcuts. I'm not 100% certain this is the same on Windows, um, but it should be. And here you're going to see all of the shortcuts. Now I have this one, that's mine, but you're probably going to have default shortcuts. So you have all the different, here's going to show you all the different areas up top that you would find your shortcuts in. Um, so you have to kind of know where you're, where those are located, um, like in the file menu. And then when you find one of these that has a shortcut, it's going to show you the shortcut down here when you click on it. Okay. So there's a lot of stuff in here. Um, so if you know where it is in the window and you're just trying to see what it is, that's your best bet. Now, if you're trying to add a shortcut for something that doesn't have one, I mean, there's, there's a good amount in here that don't, there can only be so many shortcuts. But so let's show you the example of the hyperlinks and I'll show you how you can go ahead and add the shortcut. So for hyperlinks, you're going to go down to the panel menus. We are going to go down to hyperlinks. So whatever you want to add a shortcut for, you're going to have to just find it in here. If you're having trouble finding it, you can usually Google it and somebody online will tell you where you can find it. <laughs> so let's go down here to hyperlinks. Here we go. So we have hyperlinks, we have edit hyperlink, and we have new hyperlink. Where is new hyperlink? New, new hyperlink. Okay. See, neither one of them have a shortcut. I don't know why, but if you're creating a digital planner, you're definitely going to want to add one for this because it's going to save you a lot of time, especially when you're editing. So to add any kind of shortcut for something you want. You just have it highlighted here and then you're going to go ahead and you're going to add a shortcut. So click down here and you're just going to click what you want to add. So for new hyperlink, I used command and Y, command Y. So when I click command Y, it automatically adds that in there. Okay. Now here's a little warning you might get. If the shortcut that you pick is applied to a different shortcut, it's going to give you a warning. This says edit in story editor. Now I don't use story editor for anything, so I'm okay with changing the shortcut. So for me, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hit assign. And so now it's going to give you a warning that you cannot modify the default set. So you have to go ahead and create a new set. And that's where I had that 
planner, but we're just going to go ahead and say yes. And I'm going to say tips tutorial so I don't get myself confused. And you want to usually do it based off of default. So everything else is the same except for this one thing you're changing. Hit OK. So now we have the shortcut added in there. So we're going to go back down to hyperlinks again. You see now we have the set tips tutorial that I just saved. So let's go back to hyperlinks. We're going to go to edit hyperlink. And again, you can pick whatever you want, but highlight it, go ahead and hit new. And then I'm just doing option Y. So one's command Y, so one's option Y. Option Y is not assigned. So that one's nice and easy for me to assign. And I'm going to assign it there. When I am done adding what I want to add, I'm going to hit save. All right. So now if I have this highlighted and I want to add a new hyperlink, I should be able to say command Y. And there we go. We have our hyperlink. So if I'm going to say page, page three, fine. Okay. I get my dotted line around here saying that, that there's a hyperlink. So if I want to edit this hyperlink, I'm just going to click on it and then I'm going to hit option Y and I'm going to get my box and now I can change what I need to change. And so our shortcut is created and you can do this process with any shortcuts that you want to add. Okay, tip number 29. Well, it's not really an InDesign tip, but I think it's a tip for, um, well, it could be an InDesign tip, but more a tip for going throughout this series with me because I can't promise I'm always gonna say things the correct way. So if you ever hear me say command as a shortcut and you have a Windows, it's control. So command equals control. And if you ever hear me say option, then option equals alt. So lastly, I wanted to go over tip number 30 is if you need to find an option you and, and you're having trouble finding it, you can just go up here to window. I mean, at least this is the case on MacBook. OK, um, you can go up here to the search window and you can just type in what you're looking for. So you can't find where copy is. If you click copy up there and you scroll down, save a copy, copy, edit and copy, it's going to show you when you highlight over it where you can find it. So copy is an edit and it's pointing to paste. And then you can also see the shortcut edit in copy. And so you can search that way. Again, I don't know for sure if this is on Windows, but it's definitely on Mac. And that is my last tip for you on this very long video. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, as a nice bonus for you guys, I have created a PDF of shortcuts that I find the most to be the most important for planner and journal creation. Check it out down in the link. It will take you over to my website. Um, in order to get that download, you just sign up with your email and it will email it right to you. Um, so I really hope that you enjoyed this video and that you found it extremely helpful. And again, throughout this series, you will be seeing these tips and tricks over again and in, in, in actual use. Um, but the next video we are going to be, which is video number four um, of the series, episode four, um, we are going to start to get into it and we're going to create our documents. Okay. And in this video, I'm going to show you how you can create your document and get it set up no matter which type of planner you're making. So this video is going to be for all of you. So hit the bell notification, subscribe, obviously, um, and make sure you don't miss it. And I will see you in the next one and we can start to really get into this thing.